the mic working? Yes. Um, so many, many months ago, um, when invited to speak, the title that I gave the organizers was the top line on the board, um, cork gluon plasma and QCD at Rick and LHC and in string theory. Um, uh, since, since then, um, actually even starting well before then, um, five of us have been writing a review paper. This is the current draft. It weighs a lot. Um, and uh, in many ways, my lecture will follow, um, my lectures will follow half of this review. Um, this review has a slightly different title, but it has the same content in the title as you can see. Um, and the purpose of this review is to provide a primer on heavy ion collisions for string theorists and a primer on gauge gravity duality for QCD theorists. Um, and I'm not going to do the primer on gauge gravity duality. Um, many other lecturers are teaching you how to do these calculations. What I decided to set myself as my goal for, for my lectures is to um, set the QCD context for you, uh, both theoretically and experimentally, although I, I am a theorist. Is Jamie in the room? There's Jamie. If you want the experimental context, Jamie Nagel, who's sitting in the back there um, with the slightly purple sunglasses, um, uh, is the local um, um, experimental heavy ion physicist. He's a member of the Phoenix Collaboration. And he, if he stays for my lectures, he can keep me honest. Um, so I'm not going to try and teach you how to do any of the gauge gravity duality calculations. I figure, um, first of all, you, the, learning how to do these calculations is the easy part. You can read the original literature, and the calculations themselves are all straightforward. What you can't get from the literature is context. Uh, and, and so that's what I'm going to try and provide. Um, and uh, the other reason, of course, is that there are many other lecturers who know more about gauge gravity duality than I do who will be speaking to you um, also. So to begin at the very beginning, what is QCD? Um, it, if you try and answer that by looking at its Lagrangian, you see a theory of quarks and gluons. And if you just look at its Lagrangian, it does not look that different than QED. So this is QED, which is a theory of electrons and photons and positrons. So here is an electron interacting with a positron by exchanging um, photons. In QCD, here is a quark interacting with an antiquark by exchanging a gluon. And I will draw this in a tough double line notation with colors. So you can see that what the gluon does is it changes the color of this quark. So here is a quark interacting with an antiquark by the exchange of a gluon. And the gluon can change the colors of the quarks. Seems like a technical difference, but it does have one, even at the level of the Lagrangian, it does have a qualitative consequence, and that is that gluons can exchange gluons. So here is a gluon exchanging a gluon. Again, drawn in a tough double line notation. So this is um, gluon gluon scattering does not arise in QED, does arise in QCD. But at the level of the Lagrangian, this just looks like a technical difference. Yes, there's some new Feynman diagrams. Um, still, uh, at the level of the Lagrangian, I should, I should uh, point out the other technical differences between QCD and QED before we get to the interesting differences. Um, here, all electrons have the same charge. They're all charge minus. Here, quarks can be red, green, or blue. There are three charges in QCD. Anti-quarks are anti-red, anti-green, anti-blue, just as positrons are anti-minus. Um, so gluons are also charged, as I said. And then also, just as over here, there are electrons, mu's, mu's and tau's, over here there are many quarks, six of them, in fact. And I will just remind you of their masses, roughly. The up quark mass is a few MeV. The down quark mass is also a few MeV. The strange quark mass is about 90 MeV. The charm quark mass is around 1,500 MeV, 1 1.5 GeV. The bottom is around 4,500 MeV. 
and the top is around 175,000 MeV. I'm going to be using MeV units most of the time because that's conventional in heavy ion physics. Um, the temperatures that I'm going to be interested in, I'm going to be interested in quark gluon plasmas with temperatures that are, let's say, 200 to 300 MeV. And that tells you that I care about these ones, and I don't care about these ones. So in the quark gluon plasmas that I will be describing, you can think of them as having three quarks rather than six. Um, it's not quite true that I don't care about these. There are a few charm quarks present, and they will be important in lecture number three. But certainly in terms of, of thinking about the bulk physics of these collisions, you can ignore charm bottom and top. OK, so far QCD, if we stop there, it just looks like it's QED with some extra bookkeeping. So what makes QCD interestingly different? Um, well, that starts with asymptotic freedom. And the idea of asympt asymptotic freedom is that in any quantum field theory, um, the vacuum is a medium. And it's a medium which can screen charge. So again, um, starting with QED. In QED, the force between electrons goes like alpha over R squared. So if I have two electrons separated by a distance R, the force is alpha over R squared. You learn in undergraduate uh, physics class that alpha is 1 over 137. Then you learn in quantum field theory that actually alpha depends on scale. And it is, in fact, an experimental fact that alpha runs with scale. Um, A plot of alpha versus R on a log scale looks something like this. Below the scale set by the mass of the electron, it's about 1 over 137, as you learn in undergraduate physics classes. And it then starts to increase. And in fact, it's been measured to be 1 over 128 in experiments done at LEP, which probe the force between electrons at the scale of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. So um, it's, it's true in QED that couplings run. It's true in QCD also. The qualitative difference is that the running goes the other way. Um, so if here's my 10 to the minus 18 meters, um, in QCD, the coupling does something like this, where uh, so this is alpha QCD as a function of scale. Here, as probed, as measured at LEP in those same experiments, um, it's around 0.1, roughly speaking. Um, so the strong interactions there are stronger than the electromagnetic interactions, but they're still weak enough that perturbative um, quantum field theory is a very good tool. But somewhere at a scale, which is of order 10 to the minus 15 meters, alpha QCD ceases to have meaning. Um, um, it becomes of order one, and it no longer makes sense. Uh, it no longer makes sense to use perturbation theory. So QCD, because of this running of the coupling constant, it comes along. It it it, it brings a scale with it, and this scale, at which the QCD interactions become strong, is called lambda QCD in energy, or since I've written it in distance, this is lambda QCD to the minus one. And lambda, if you ask what is it. It's the size of hadrons. Um, all hadrons have roughly the same size, um, except it's, it's the size of hadrons that are made up of light quarks. Hadrons made up only of heavy quarks are smaller, but we'll come back to that again um, on Wednesday. So um, QCD does have a length scale. It's not a conformal theory. Um, and. Um, The flip side of asymptotic freedom is that if you ask a better question than what is QCD, if you ask what does QCD describe, um, in most circumstances, what it describes does not look anything like the quarks and gluons that you see in the Lagrangian. The quasi-particles of the QCD vacuum Uh, 
um, are what we call hadrons. They have names like pions, protons, etc. And they are both colorless and heavy. Gluons are massless. Up and down quarks have masses of a few MeV. There's no hadron. The lightest hadron, the pion, has a mass of 100 and something MeV. Protons are roughly 1,000 MeV, very loosely speaking. So the quasi-particles are much heavier than the things you see in the Lagrangian. And they're also colorless. They're colorless bound states. They're neutral. And these two, um, um, oh, this, this one doesn't slide. These two um, central differences between what you actually see in nature, you know, what makes us up, we are made of quasi-particles of the QCD vacuum, um, plus electrons. But certainly most of our mass is the quasi-particles of the QCD vacuum. Um, and the, the difference between the stuff that we're made of and the things that occur in the Lagrangian that you write down or that Gross, Wilczek, and Polk wrote, wrote down, um, there are two central differences. This one is related to what is called deconfinement. Sorry, deconfinement comes in a minute. To confinement. This one, in fact, is related to what's called chiral symmetry breaking. In QCD, in the Lagrangian, other than those small mass terms, small quark mass terms up there, um, there are separate global symmetries for left and right-handed quarks. But in the QCD vacuum, there is a non-zero condensate, Q bar left, Q right, which breaks global symmetries, gives you Goldstone bosons, as, as Son mentioned. Those are the pions. Um, and this non-zero expectation value has the same quantum numbers as a mass term. And, and it can be thought of as um, giving the large mass to all the hadrons. So with that um, cartoon introduction to QCD, we can ask, you know, why is it still interesting to study QCD? Um, it's, it's a theory that's been around for a while. Why, why are many of us still interested in studying it? That's partly why is it interesting and partly why is it difficult. So why, and these are related questions. So my first answer as to why it's worth studying is it's the only example we know in nature of a strongly coupled gauge theory. Um, the key words in that sentence were the only example we know. It may be that at the LHC, when we probe the next layer of structure, it, it could be that electroweak symmetry breaking, when understood, will arise from strong dynamics in some new sector not yet currently seen. Maybe, maybe what experimentalists at the LHC will discover will not be a weakly interacting Higgs. Maybe they'll discover um, uh, mechanisms for the breaking of electroweak symmetry that rely on strong dynamics. If we would like to understand that, it would behoove us to understand the one example where we do have strongly, in strongly interacting dynamics um, to understand that well. So do we understand it? Well, we do understand it at short distances. Um, out here, where the theory is asymptotically free, uh, perturbation theory works. Standard quantum field theory methods are just fine. And so certainly, for those of your, your, your friends back in your home institutions who are using QCD to make predictions for the LHC, um, they are, those friends of yours are wise to be using conventional quantum field theory. They don't need to um, learn about gauge gravity duality. Um, what they're doing is well controlled and very well motivated by the experiments soon to come at the LHC. But if you're interested in understanding physics at this scale, um, things get harder because, as I said, the quasi-particles, the excitations of the vacuum, are they, these hadrons which don't look at all like the fundamental actors in the Lagrangian. So experimentally speaking, if you look back over the last 20 years, there have been two experimental paths to addressing this challenge. One path, which I won't follow, involves studying the structure of hadrons. You build uh, an electron accelerator, shoot electrons at a proton, and study the structure of the proton. This was first done in the late 60s and early 70s at SLAC. It has since been done at higher energies at HERA and at higher luminosities at Jefferson Lab. Um, the other path, again, with a 20-year history, is to try and get away from the vacuum. Um, all of these complications are complications of the quasi-particles of the QCD vacuum. And any quantum field theory has phases. Maybe there are other phases of QCD. Maybe the phases 
the quasi-particles of other phases of QCD might be easier to understand. This might give us some purchase in understanding the physics that QCD describes. And this really was the motivation um, going back more than probably, certainly going back to the early 80s for thinking about heavy ion collision physics, for planning and, and designing, developing, constructing um, the relativistic heavy ion collider, and for doing many theoretical calculations of QCD at non-zero temperature. And this is the story that we're going to um, follow in my lectures. So um, yes, I'm listening while I erase. It's of order lambda QCD. It's of order lambda QCD. Lambda QCD is not a precisely defined quantity, but the size of, ha size of hadrons is. The size of hadrons is about one Fermi, and one Fermi in energy units is 200 MeV. OK. So. Um, QCD is more than its vacuum. You can actually think of multiple axes to a phase diagram for QCD, um, more than two, but you have to have two to get anywhere. So that way of the simplest way of thinking about the phases of QCD is in terms of two axes, one of which is temperature, and the other one of which is the chemical potential for baryon number. So the vacuum is here. So everything I've talked about so far is at one point on the phase diagram. Um, the chemical potential for baryon number, that, that controls the density. It's not equal to the density, but it controls the density. We do know of objects which live here. They're called nuclei. Nuclei have a non-zero density, and they have zero temperature. So they sit somewhere there. And um, the expectation from theory, some of which is solid and some of which is squishy, as I'll explain, but the expectation at a cartoon level is a phase diagram which looks something like this. In fact, I'll put another line in here. Um, so let me, let me try and describe what the different regions of this phase diagram are. So if, if I excite the vacuum a little bit, I have a gas of the quasi-particles of the vacuum. So if I have some small but non-zero temperature, I have a gas of hadrons. Now, going this way, that corresponds to taking nuclei and squeezing them without heating them up. The only way we know of that this is done in nature is in neutron stars. So neutron stars, which will not be the subject of my lectures, but neutron stars certainly achieve densities that are higher than that of nuclei. It's, in fact, not known how dense their centers are, but they're somewhere between 2 and 10 times um, the density of nuclei. So they explore a region of the phase diagram that's at zero temperature on these scales um, but, and, and has a higher density than that of nuclei. And what may exist in the center of neutron stars, so we don't know whether neutron, I'll put a question mark here. We don't know whether neutron stars go only to here or go out to here. Um, and These phases out here at high temperatures and low densities are phases that are called color superconductors. What are they? Well, if you're at high, temp high densities and low temperatures, then you have Fermi surfaces. Um, there are, in fact, nine Fermi surfaces because there's three quark colors, three quark flavors, nine fermions, nine Fermi surfaces. And the quarks are famous for attracting each other because in vacuum they like to form protons and neutrons. So there must be an attraction between quarks. And BCS teach, teach us that anytime you have um, a system of fermions with the Fermi surface and attractions, you um, get, uh, get pairing. And this is a story for another day. And in fact, it's a story that I lectured on here at TASI some number of years ago. Maybe KT remembers when I was here. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it um, in these lectures. The reason I'm not going to talk about it in these lectures is, to date, uh, gauge gravity duality has not played a role in the understanding of these phases. 
Um, you will hear from other lecturers much progress just very recently in using gauge gravity duality to understand systems with Fermi surfaces. My selfish hope is that um, from that progress, which is very recent, insights will come here, but um, not yet. So we're going to leave we're going to leave this for the for the rest of my lectures. Although um, I love to talk about it, so I, I could, but it has nothing to do with gauge gravity duality. Now, um, what about up here? Well, up here we have what is, has always been called the quark gluon plasma. And if you ask what is quark gluon plasma, the simplest definition of quark gluon plasma is it's the, it's the T goes to infinity phase of QCD. Um, and when you, in any quantum field theory, if you take the temperature to infinity, that means that entropy wins over order. And so it means that the symmetries are those of the Lagrangian. Um, so chiral symmetry breaking has to go away if you take T to infinity. Um, furthermore, in QCD, because of the fact that the coupling gets weak at um, infinite energy, um, for T goes to infinity, I emphasize, um, we must get a weakly coupled gas of quasi-particles. Of quark and gluon quasi-particles. And, but that might be up somewhere above the ceiling on this phase diagram. We don't know how high a temperature you have to go to before that becomes a good description. Yes? Um, it's OK, good. So it's, I was not going to use that analogy. It's like the ionization of a gas. OK. So now I was, uh, so you've, you've um, flagged exactly what I was going to say next, which is why did I not draw a boundary line here? Well, there is, in fact, no difference in symmetry between the quark gluon plasma phase of QCD and the vacuum because chiral symmetry breaking, um, because chiral symmetry is slightly broken even in the vacuum because the quarks do have a mass. Okay? If the up and down quarks were, were massless with m equals 0, then there would be a difference in symmetry between this phase and that, and there would have to be a line here. And in fact, it is thought that in, the, in that theory in which you take what's called the chiral limits, you take the up and down quarks massless, it's thought that there's a second order phase transition here. Um, there's a lot of evidence for that, but it, I, 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 I won't say it's, it's um, known rigorously, but there's a lot of evidence for that. What we do know for sure is that um, once you, what, well, we know there would have to be a transition. We don't know for sure it's second order is what I meant, um, although there's a lot of evidence for it. What we do know for sure from lattice calculations is that in a theory with quarks that are not massless, so pions that are not massless, the Goldstone bosons are not, are, are not massless. They're light, but not massless. There's a crossover here. So physics is very different down here than up here, but there's a region of temperatures where the physics changes continuously but dramatically. Um, and this. Um, temperature, which is off TC, is the, the symbol that's used. You can think of C as meaning crossover instead of critical. Um, it's around 170 MeV. And this is plus or minus about 10%. And this we know from lattice QCD calculations. Lattice QCD, Tom is the local expert. Tom DeGrand sitting up there who leads hikes when he's not doing lattice QCD. Um, um, Lattice QCD is, is, is a method of calculation in QCD that's very good at calculating um, in a strongly coupled regime. And it's very good at calculating any, any, any thermodynamic quantity. In the context of Sohn's lectures, it can, anything that you can phrase in terms of the Euclidean path integral can be calculated in lattice QCD. Um, the kinds of things that require um, uh, real time, lattice QCD runs into difficulties. But thermodynamics is well understood 
from these lattice calculations. Um, and I should also say that the lattice calculations are um, um, do a good job on this vertical axis of the phase diagram. They are, um, and they are also being extended into a regime where mu is not zero but small compared to t. But way out here, lattice calculations are difficult. Um, that's an understatement. What kills them is what's called the fermion sign problem, um, which I just mentioned for those of you who know it. We're not going to be going out here, so I won't talk about it in these lectures. Yes? Um, perturbative QCD is valid um, far up and far to the right. And I should be careful, um, as I'm about to say, I, I, weakly coupled QCD. There, there's still non-perturbative physics, but it's non-perturbative physics that's still controlled by a weak coupling. Um, out here, it's easier to explain. For any of you who've studied BCS theory, you should know that um, the superconducting critical temperature goes like e to the minus 1 over the coupling. So that means there's non-perturbative physics involved. But when that coupling is small, um, it's a um, controlled description. The same thing happens far out to the, here, far out, far out to the right. Um, and by the way, the person who figured out the ways in which this story out here is interestingly different from BCS is Son, sitting right there. Um, either he or I could talk about that, but I think neither of us is planning to. Um, yes? OK, good. So I don't know what that was. Um, right, I guess you realize I'm not finished with this diagram. So um, we have reasons to believe, although they are um, squishy, that if you go, so here we have lattice calculations. Out here we have models. And in many models, but not necessarily in nature, but in many models, the transition out here is first order. If the transition is first order here and a crossover there, then there has to be some place where this line of first order transitions ends. This is called a critical point. And this will be what I want to talk about on Thursday. So what I want to talk about on Thursday is how to look for this critical point in experiments. Um, because the theory, the theory, as I said, is squishy, so it will be nice to have experimental confirmation um, of its existence or refutation, one or the other. Um, so that will be Thursday. Um, OK, heavy ion collisions. I just mentioned the word heavy ion collisions. What are they? Well, you take two nuclei, slam them together, build an accelerator, slam them together at high energies. And um, um, as Son mentioned, there's this initial non-equilibrium phase. And then we believe by a time of around one Fermi, and I'm going to explain tomorrow why we believe this, um, you have approximate local thermal equilibrium. And if you have local thermal equilibrium, that means I can say we've landed somewhere on the phase diagram. So I collided two nuclei. You should not draw an upward line going from here to there, because the process of going from two nuclei to this stuff is far from equilibrium. And this is an equilibrium phase diagram. But somehow you've landed there. So you have this little drop, using a, looking ahead, using a word that makes it sound like a drop of liquid. You have a little drop of this stuff, but there's no walls holding it in. Okay. And that means it expands and cools. And so it follows some trajectory downwards on the phase diagram. And this happens quickly. The time scales for this expansion and cooling are, uh, well, there are many Fermi's. But if I turn it into seconds, it's 10 to the minus 20. Two, or if it's if for 10 to the minus 21, if you're lucky, seconds. So it's a it's a very rapid on human time scales expansion, um, and that's what we're going to be talking about um, for a lot of the lectures. Okay, now you do another collision at a lower energy, at lower energies, as we'll discuss on. Well, I'll talk about this on Thursday. At lower energies, the place where you land on the phase diagram moves to the right and down. So this is um, decreasing collision energy. Now, you should not be, none of you should be surprised that when you decrease the collision energy, the temperatures you achieve goes down. I think you'll just buy that. Why does the baryon chemical potential go up? Well, 
the way to think about that is to ask, what does baryon chemical potential actually measure? Uh, measure is the wrong one. What does it control? It controls the um, baryon to entropy ratio. And what's happening, if I think about it this way, if I go up in energy, I'm colliding two nuclei. They have baryon number 400, 200 here, 200 there. And um, the baryon number doesn't change as I go to higher energy. Actually, if anything, it goes down a little bit, but that's not the main effect. The main effect is that as I go up in energy, I dilute that baryon number with more and more and more entropy. So going up in energy means that you produce more and more entropy. That entropy dilutes the barrier number and gives you an effective chemical potential, which goes down as you increase the energy. It goes up as you decrease the energy. And this will be the device that we will use on Thursday to talk about how to look for this critical point in experiments. For today, I will. the last thing I will draw on this phase diagram is a line right here. This is what the, earth, what the universe did. The universe has a baryon to entropy ratio of about 10 to the minus 10 or so. So the universe's chemical potential as it cooled through the QCD phase transition was to a very good approximation, zero. And the universe started out hot. It cooled down this transition, uh, down this phase diagram. And it passed through this transition temperature when it was about 10 microseconds old. So the, the expansion of the universe was much, 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 much slower than heavy ion, the expansion of a heavy ion collision. But one nice analogy, which I'll use several times, is to think of a heavy ion collision as a little bang. Okay, the universe is the big bang. Heavy ion collision is a little bang. You reproduce stuff which has the properties of the one microsecond old universe. That then expands and cools, just like in cosmology, but much, much faster. And, and uh, particularly at these high energy collisions where we can ignore stuff like this. You're cooling through the crossover just as cosmology did. You are sort of recapitulating the expansion of the universe, the first few microseconds of the expansion of the universe in the laboratory um, in a small volume and greatly accelerated. So, um, you know, when I'm sitting on an airplane and someone, I start talking with the person in the seat next to me about what I'm interested in, and when I'm describing these experiments, that's, that's the place where I start. Um, the person in the airplane is not interested in the fundamental properties of QCD. I'm, I think you are, but they're not. They, they, but they like the idea that you're reproducing the stuff of the Big Bang and studying its properties. Yes? Um, there's no good reason for that. That's why I said it's a squishy fact and not a um, rigorous one. There's no, and in fact, there's no, there's no reason in principle why this critical point, you, you couldn't push it all the way over to here, okay? Um, there are actually good reasons why this is first order, okay? So there, there, are, there are good reasons why this is first order. Um, there actually are not good reasons why this is first order. Um, so in fact, there are people who speculate that the phase diagram could have a second critical point right here, okay? And that's a legitimate speculation, not ruled out by anyth anything that we know rigorously. The, the one thing which we do know is that this one is first order. So somewhere out here, there's a line of first order transitions, but you know, it could end like it could just look like this, with nothing up here for heavy ion collision experiments to discover in terms of looking for a critical point. That's possible. <laughs> I didn't hear you. There's no sense that. No, if it, it, it can be second order. So in fact, if, so if the phase diagram, if I make the pessimistic, the, the pessimistic but not ruled out possibility is that for the phase diagram of nature, it's crossover all the way along here. That would mean that if I turn the quark masses to zero, it would be second order all the way along here. Okay, that's possible. That's possible. Um, the, the, you know, physics is not a democracy. Um, when you do calculations in models, people have used many models. They all seem to have this first order phase transition. But just because by vote of different models, that's what you get, does not mean that's nature's choice. Right. And so I haven't drawn everything. Why is that continuously connected to the quarks? Okay, so for that, I would have to explain what this line is. This is the color flavor locked phase. It turns out that the symmetries of the color flavor locked phase are the same as the symmetries of three flavor baryonic matter. 
Chiral symmetry is, this is not where I want it to go, but chiral symmetry is broken by a new mechanism out here, okay, by a different mechanism. But at the level of symmetries, who cares about mechanism? The chiral symmetry is broken in this phase. Um, and so it is, in fact, possible. You have to draw a line. In fact, you have to decorate the phase diagonal a little bit further. You have to do this. This is the nuclear superfluid down here. And there's a second critical point here, which is, in fact, studied in low energy nuclear collisions. Um, and you can then, if you wish, try and erase this line. Uh, it would have to be, you would have to have, for that to work, this line has to go away. It has to be CFL everywhere. And it's then possible. Um, but I have to explain what CFL is to explain why. OK. So um, yes, Michael. OK, so the, a, a, a classic and venerable model going back to long before QCD is called the nambu john lazinia model, where you treat the interaction between quarks as point-like scattering instead of the exchange of gluons. You get rid of the gluons. You then have two. It's a two-parameter model. It has a coupling constant, which is dimensionful. And, it's, um, and it, it, it has an ultraviolet cutoff, which you have, to, you have to think of as a parameter of the model. You fit those two parameters to two observed facts. And then you um, look and see how well the model does at describing other facts. Um, it has a long history. It's a good way of guiding your intuition, but it's not QCD. Another example of a model is the bag model. Um, another example of a model is the linear sigma model for you. Um, in all of those, there are first order phase transitions. OK. Um, but what I wanted to do before I leave, um, before I start talking about heavy ion collisions, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what you see on the lattice on this vertical axis. Because um, that you can take to the bank. Um, so lattice QCD, as I already said, is a good tool for calculating thermodynamics. So let's talk about what you find. So you can calculate, for example, the energy density as a function of temperature. And it's conventional to plot the energy density divided by t to the fourth. And um, I'm actually going to try and be quantitative here. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15. 15.6. 15.6 is a special value because 15.6 is what you would get for non-interacting quarks and gluons. It's what is called in the lattice literature the Stefan Boltzmann value. And now you ask, what, does, what do you find from these calculations? And now I need units on the horizontal axis. Um, so I'll start here at 100 MeV. So this is temperature in MeV. Um, here's 200. Here's 300. 400. Here's 500. And the energy density looks something like this. Um, at, there's a point about there. And there's a point. Uh, Oh, yeah, and I'm also going to draw for fun. I'm going to draw a line here, which is 3 quarters of the non-interacting value. Um, and it looks something like this. And that looks great. It looks like you have an almost conformal theory when you get above TC. So clearly. This is not, QCD is not a conformal theory. It has a scale. That scale is lambda QCD, which is to say it's TC, temperature of a crossover. But once you get above that crossover, this looks relatively conformal. Um, but we're not done yet on this plot. But let me just put on here, um, this gets up to 
In the latest calculations, it gets up to sort of halfway between um, the three-quarter line and the Stefan-Boltzmann line. But you can also compute um, the pressure over t to the fourth. And that looks more like this. Um, it's here, and it crosses this line only out about here somewhere. It looks more like this. Um, so this is p over t to the fourth. In a conformal theory, epsilon minus 3 uh, sorry, this is 3p over t to the fourth. In a conformal theory, epsilon has to be equal to 3p. Epsilon minus 3p has to be 0. The trace has to be 0. So in this regime above Tc, we're still in a regime which is quite nonconformal. Um, and it's only when you get further up here where QCD actually starts to look, the thermodynamics of QCD starts to, starts to look conformal. So this should be a caution, because as you will see, the region which Rick is exploring Sort of Rick is exploring, um, in some sense, some region like roughly like this. And the LHC will be exploring some region, I don't know, maybe that's a little too far, but something along the lines like this. So one of the cautionary remarks to um, th those of us, myself included, who like trying to apply lessons learned from calculations in a conformal theory to QCD is that it's, you're, playing, you're playing a little bit on, a little bit on the edge here. Um, maybe things will become better at the LHC. This is, this is from a lattice calculation. OK, then the other thing you can calculate on the lattice. So I should say, by the way, that this, this, this shows deconfinement. This is deconfinement. Because what you have down here is a gas of massive hadrons, gas of heavy hadrons. And what you have up here is, I don't want to say gas anymore, but a system of these light degrees of freedom. And um, certainly before the data from Rick, um, um, it was thought of as a plasma of quasi-particles. Because look at that. I mean, it's pretty close to this line. And yeah, OK, we knew the pressure was here, but let's ignore that. Um, the other thing that is well calculated on the lattice is, um, so here's the same TC. And you find that this um, chiral order parameter melts away. And if this, is it, if this is its melting at one temperature, so this is, sorry, this is at um, one quark mass. This is a heavier quark mass. This is at a lighter quark mass. And maybe. Lattice calculations are never done at mq equals 0. But the extrapolations of what's known at different quark masses is consistent with the hypothesis that if you take mq to 0, you get a second order phase transition, which looks like this. But that's um, it's, it's, it's uh, consistent with that. But I would say it's not rigorously demonstrated, certainly. Um, OK, so you can see on the lattice that, this, that as you go up in temperature, the two dramatic differences between um, the quasi-particles of the vacuum and what you see in the Lagrangian do go away. You do get deconfinement. You do get restoration of chiral symmetry. But um, do you get a weakly interacting gas of quarks and gluons? Now, to, to defend the, the pre-Rick theorists, um, nobody before Rick, nobody thought that physics here, sort of 1 half to 2 TC, nobody thought this would be truly weakly coupled. Okay? 300 MeV temperature. Typical momentum in a plasma at 300 MeV is pi times t. That's a loose figure of merit. So that's about a GeV. QCD with momenta of 1 GeV is not yet very weakly coupled. Um, so, um, And furthermore, um, I didn't mention this, but even if you take t goes to infinity, um, physics at uh, a length scale 1 over g squared t, sorry, g to the fourth t is non perturbative. Sorry, 1 over g squared t. g fourth t is something else. 
and this was known um, to the ancients. Um, so the expectations before Rick were not that everything at Rick would be weakly coupled, but we were seduced by really by this pink curve. Okay. And the expectation was that, see, we know as t goes to infinity, we have a weakly coupled gas of quasi-particles. And look, nothing dramatic seems to be changing, at least down to maybe around here. And it's not that dramatic even all the way down to here. So the expectation was that um, the quasi-particle picture would be valid, but the quasi-particles wouldn't be necessarily all that weakly interacting. So the expectation was that the picture that's valid at t goes to infinity would hold down here even if theorists had to work harder because the coupling wasn't all that weak. Um, then along came Rick, the relativistic heavy ion collider, which started doing experiments in 2000 and 2001. And I would say by 2003, although some would say by 2005, but by that 2003 to 2005 timescale, the picture of the quark-gluon plasma had um, changed completely. And uh, everyone now thinks of the quark-gluon plasma in this regime as a liquid. So not as a system described by well-defined proof. Um, does somebody have expertise in putting this back together? Let's see if this works. It actually fell apart. Is it still working? OK. Um, so um, the story that I want to tell in the, in, 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 in the next, um, in the, my first three lectures, really, is how we came to, to learn from experiments that this stuff here, the stuff of the early universe when the universe was a few microseconds old, is best thought of as a liquid with low viscosity. Um, and um, I, I'm going to give the current view of this, starting from Rick data as it exists today, but really um, this picture uh, gelled um, by about 2005. Um, now, before I do that, I'm going to give a primer on heavy ion collisions. But before I do that, I want to tell a story which is perhaps apocryphal, but it's attributed to Vicky Weisskopf, um, whom I met late in his life. Just at, when I arrived at MIT, he was still present. Um, and Vicky apparently, many, many years ago, many decades ago, um, told, said, made the following set of remarks in some colloquium somewhere. He said, if you um, took a good theoretical physicist um, and gave them the laws of QED, the Lagrangian of QED, written on a sheet of paper, put them on a desert island, and asked them to calculate from this Lagrangian, what, what does this Lagrangian describe? Vicky's claim was that a good theoretical physicist should be able to figure out that this Lagrangian describes atoms and should be able to figure out that if you have many atoms, there can be gases and there can be solids. Um, but, Vicky claimed, no theoretical physicist would figure out that liquids existed. Um, and Vicky was not thinking about the quark-gluon plasma. What Vicky was thinking about was just the fact that liquids, first of all, are inherently strongly coupled, and second of all, don't exist in any limit of a phase diagram. Gases are the high temperature phase, solids are the low temperature phase. What we theoretical physicists always do is take limits. And liquids don't exist in a limit. Um, that was what Vicky was thinking of. Um, the story that I've just told you, and that is the subject of my first three lectures, proves that Vicky was correct. Okay? Because the whole community of theoretical physicists have had the theory of QCD written down on a sheet of paper since 1973. Okay? Um, we weren't on a desert island. Uh, we were talking to each other. Um, but still, if you go back to pre-Rick days, nobody was talking about shear viscosity. Nobody was, talking, nobody was even asking the question as to whether the quark-gluon plasma was a liquid. Um, this this uh, was brought upon us by a set of circumstances, but the key thing it was brought upon us by was data. Um, so it, it, it proves this, this, the story of, of um, the history of the understanding of quark-gluon plasma proves that Vicky was correct. OK, so here ends the introduction to my introduction. Um, now, my second introduction is I wanted to introduce heavy ion collisions. What are these experiments? What do you look for? Um, and uh, we'll get to how you get a shear viscosity out of them tomorrow. Um, so Son already uh, started this. So I don't have to tell you that um, 
You should think of them as the collisions of pancakes. That was one of the things I was going to say. But I do want to give you various, sort of some intuition for the scales that are involved in various different senses. So at RIC, experimentalists accelerate gold nuclei. So they do gold, gold collisions at a center of mass energy, which is 200 GeV times the atomic number of the nucleus. And the atomic number of gold, I can never remember it, but it's something like 200. The atomic number of lead is roughly the same. And so this means that these are 40 TeV collisions. The total energy in a Rick collision is about 40 TeV, much larger than in the proton-proton collisions at the LHC. But um, what really matters is the, um, the, 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 this 200 GeV is a better figure of merit to think of because what it means is that a typical proton-proton collision occurring in the middle of that nucleus-nucleus collision has a center of mass energy of 200 GeV. So we have these Lorentz contracted pancakes flying at each other. They have a gamma, as Son said, a gamma of 100. Um, their thickness is about 0.1 Fermi. Their radius is about 7 Fermi. The diameter is about 14 Fermi. That's 7 Fermi is the radius of a gold nucleus. Now, what's, well, how are these numbers going to change at the LHC? At the LHC, um, when the LHC operates at its design energy, it will have square root of s of 5.5 TeV times A. Um, this is not this year. It's, it's in the future. Um, this year, so this is um, LHC at its design. Um, in, at the LHC in 2010, November, the first heavy ion collisions are going to be done at the LHC. And there, the square root of s will be half this. What's well, one half of 5.5? So still an order of magnitude higher in collision energy than at REC. Um, and the atoms, the nuclei used at the LHC are gold instead of, sorry, are lead instead of gold, but they also have an A of around 200. So the A's are about the same. The nuclei are the same size, roughly speaking, to a very good approximation, the same size. So the main thing that changes as you go from RIC to the LHC is the collision energy. I should also mention that both RIC and the LHC do proton-proton collisions also. Um, the LHC is famous for that. And better known for that, of course, than for heavy ion collisions. Um, but RIC does proton-proton collisions, too. Um, and furthermore, both RIC and the LHC, well, RIC has done, the LHC will do proton nucleus collisions. So um, why might you want to do that? Well, that is um, the best benchmark. Um, if you want to decide as an experimentalist whether some phenomenon that you've seen in gold-gold collisions is or isn't interesting, you, tr you try doing proton-gold collisions. And if you see it in proton gold collisions, it means that whatever you saw in gold gold collisions, it wasn't a many body physics effect. It wasn't what we're in these lectures going to define as interesting. Um, OK, so in thinking about these collisions as an experimentalist, what's the very first thing you measure? The very first, the, the very first thing you measure is you count particles in the final state. Um, so how many particles are there in the final state? The initial state is 400 nucleons. What's the final state? Well, the way that experimentalists plot final state multiplicities is as a function of pseudo rapidity. Um, pseudo rapidity is minus log of the tan of theta by 2. What is theta? Here is a collision. And the, here's, a, here's a scattered particle. This is theta. So um, if theta is pi by 2, this corresponds to eta is equal to 0. So eta equals 0 is particles that come off perpendicular to the beam axis. 
Um, eta equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Eta equals 5 is particles that basically go down the beam pipe. And minus 5 is particles that go down the beam pipe the other way. And um, this pseudo rapidity for massless particles eta is equal to the rapidity, which is one half log of E plus P over E minus P. So for massless particles, um, um, there's a direct mapping between the angle, which is what you measure in your detector, and the rapidity. Um, it's, con you, it's conventional. If you want to convert rapidity to pseudo rapidity, you have to know the mass of the particle. It's conventional um, to plot d n charge d eta, so the number of charged particles per unit rapidity. It's conventional to plot that because that's the directly measured quantity. Converting it into pseudo rapidity um, is a chore that we will not do. So you, may, you count charged particles, and you find that per unit rapidity, you have about, where can I write this? You have about 650 charged particles per unit rapidity. So for, um, plus 1 and minus 1 correspond roughly to 45 degrees. Not precisely, but roughly. So within, so here's my collision. Within 45 degrees this way, 45 degrees that way, I have 2 times 650, so 1,300 charged particles. But the collision doesn't stop at 45 degrees. If I draw a cartoon of what is seen, this is, it's not dead flat, by the way, and there are error bars on this. Um, but it sort of looks like this, and then it starts to fall off. It's pretty flat out to around 2, not dead flat, and then it starts to fall off. And um, there are error bars all the way across this. And um, you then integrate under this curve, and you find that the number of charged particles at, in a Rick collision, um, in a head-on Rick collision, is 5,060 plus or minus 250. So when you collide two gold nuclei at Rick, you make 5,000 charged particles. Yes? Um, it doesn't determine it, the energy momentum rate, rate relation for massless particles is E. Yeah, so this is sorry, this is PZ. I misspoke. Um, okay. Thank you. Pardon me? Then what? No, sorry, and this is the same question Sabir was asking. It's PZ. The rem that's, that's where the angle comes in. The rest of the momentum is, is perpendicular. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you for both of you. Um, yeah. Well, but actually, so there's a there was a detector called Phobos that went out pretty far. I don't remember whether it went out to, um, if I cheat and look in the review being written, it went out, uh, th there's data um, out to just beyond five. So there's, there's, there's points all the way along here. It's true you don't go all the way out to theta equals zero, but they went uh, to, to theta equals zero, but they went pretty close. Um, okay, uh, and then you have to, if you if you want to know how many particles are there in total, you multiply by about 1.6 to include neutral particles, and 1.5 is what you should all guess. Um, 1.5. The reason you should all guess. 1.5 is that mostly most of these are pions. And there's pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. And if isospin is a good symmetry, you should expect equal numbers of pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. And that would mean that there's, um, to include neutral particles, you should multiply by 1.5. People do a lot more work, and they get 1.6. Um, so, the takeaway message is there's about 8,000 hadrons in the final state. So 
So the challenge that experimentalists have is to measure the identity and momentum of as many as possible of those 8,000 hadrons. Um, one way of saying this theoretically is that lots of, lots of entropy has been produced. You started with 400 particles, you end up with 8,000 particles, you've produced a lot of entropy. The Counting the number of charged particles, by the way, is it's day one physics. Um, going out to 8 equals 5 is not day one physics. But counting the number of particles um, between plus, um, plus and minus 1 in rapidity will be done day one at the LHC. And it, there's, it's an interesting parlor game. There are many people who have tried to predict what that multiplicity will be at the LHC. Um, the range of predictions, I think, for this number we've got Rick. This number at Rick is 650. The range of predictions for that number at the LHC ranges from about 1,000 on the very low side to 3,000 on the very high side. Um, and it's not something which is under good theoretical control. But just to give you a sense that it does depend on energy, I can show you what this curve looks like at lower energies. Um, this peaking at about 350. So this was for root s of 200 GeV, and this is square root of s of 19.8 GeV. So you increase the collision energy by one order of magnitude, and the number of particles produced per unit rapidity went up by less than a factor of two. And, and the LHC is another order of magnitude. So um, by this naive argument, which is um, typically attributed to my colleague Vid Busha, uh, by this naive argument, you would expect um, um, a little less than twice 650. And that's sort of on the low side of the predictions. OK. Did I see a hand? No, it was someone moving a hand, but not. So um, I was now going to draw the space-time diagram, which Son drew for me. And the point that I wanted to make, so this is the same diagram that Son drew. So this is z, and this is time. And this is um, the tau at which the system equilibrates. And we'd like to know that tau. We don't, at this moment, we don't know it. One of the, the, the purposes of tomorrow's lecture will be to explain why from experiment, we, the combination of experiment and theory, we think it's around one Fermi. Joe. Yes. This is for head-on collisions, for central collisions. Um, and we'll talk tomorrow about non-head-on collisions. That's, that's, that's the biggest you can make it. Um, and one of the interesting things about um, equilibration is that when a system equilibrates, it forgets its origins. So um, equilibrium means loss of memory of initial conditions, except for conserved quantities. And one of the quantities which is thought to be approximately conserved after equilibration is entropy. It is thought that the entropy production occurs very early. And all this stuff that you make, the entropy that you produce, then equilibrates. And this hydrodynamic, so this is the, re this is the regime where hydrodynamics works. Um, that there's not that much entropy production during the hydrodynamic expansion. This is related to the fact that the viscosity is small. Foreshadowing tomorrow. No, we don't. That's it, it, if, if eta was larger, there'd be, there, you'd have dissipative hydrodynamics. You'd produce entropy during the expansion. Um, if eta is zero, then we know. It is not zero, it's small. Um, and then another question you can ask is out here in the late time phase, 
there's a gas of hadrons. Do we know that during this hadron gas phase, which is no longer describable hydrodynamically, do we know that during this hadron gas phase, entropy production is small? And it is thought that, of course, there's some entropy produced here, there's some entropy produced here, but it's thought that most of the entropy production is there. So actually, the, the kind of people who try and predict this, um, this gross feature of the collision, namely the total number of particles, they are the kind of people who are interested not in the quark gluon plasma physics, but in this early time physics. Um, there's a large community of, of people who work on this subject. Um, uh, to date, I have not been one of them, so we're not going to talk about it in the lectures because I would be ignorant. Well, I would be um, not sufficiently well informed. Which numbers? Yes. So, well, the hadrons aren't appearing in the early time, but the entropy is. But these numbers which, which numbers? The 8,000 hadrons? Yes. That's what's seen by the experimentalists after the particles have traveled a few meters and made tracks in their detector. So that's, that's in the final state long, long, long after the um, interesting physics has occurred, which happened in the first 10 to the minus 21 seconds on length scales of Fermi's, 10, uh, 10 Fermi say. Okay, so um, the next question you can ask um, is, um, can we estimate the energy density? This is an interesting question because, um, you know, what's the energy density on this curve? It's an interesting question for lots of reasons, but not least of all because we saw from lattice QCD that lattice QCD can calculate the energy density. Um, and so let me now explain a very um, straightforward and simplified, simplistic way of estimating the energy density, which has the virtue of giving you a lower bound. This uh, little calculation was first done by Bjork Kane sometime in the 1980s. So let's say I want to estimate the energy density at a time tau naught, and I'm going to take tau naught to be one Fermi. But the, I'll write a formula with a tau naught in it, but the value of tau naught that I'm going to be interested in is one Fermi. I claim that this is bigger than the Bjorkain estimate, where the Bjorkain estimate is the following. Two Okay. This is a very simple formula. Let me walk through each of the pieces. Um, this is the sum over all the particles in the final state um, of the transverse energy, which is m squared plus pt squared. t means transverse. pt squared plus pz squared is the total momentum squared. And this is approximately, it's 800 GeV at rec. This is det, d eta. So this is the total transverse energy per unit rapidity. So those 650 particles, 650 charged particles plus um, the appropriate number of neutrals altogether have a transverse energy of about 800 GeV. And the idea then is you look at all that, you look at those eight, you look at those 650 particles, you run the clock backwards, and you ask what volume could they have been in. Um, and this two here comes because it's conventional to consider eta between minus 1 and 1. And that gives two units of eta, so 2 times det d eta. And then this is a volume. So pi r squared is an area. This is the area of a nucleus, the, trans the transverse area of a nucleus. And we're working here at 1 Fermi. It's true that after this collision, this little blob of stuff is going to explode. It's going to expand. But one Fermi after the collision, it can't have expanded very much. Remember that R, R is 7 Fermi. And one Fermi after the collision, just by causality, 
the biggest it could possibly be is 8 for me, and we're not going to worry about the difference between 7 and 8. And actually, it won't even have gotten to 8 yet. Now, what's this 2 tau naught? Well, those two pancakes come in. One Fermi after the collision, the reseeding pancakes are two Fermis apart. So this defines a longitudinal distance. So this is um, how far apart the reseeding pancakes are. So this is Bjorkane's um, um, estimate of the energy density. If you put in numbers at REC, it's about 5 GeV per cubic Fermi. And if you then go look at the lattice calculation, epsilon critical from the lattice is around 1 GeV per cubic Fermi. So now you see why it was important that I have a greater than sign here. So now I have to explain to you why there's a greater than sign here. So this is a crude estimate of the energy density. Why is it an underestimate? It's an underestimate for two reasons. First of all, why did I pick minus 1 less than 8 or less than 1? I could have picked minus 2 less than 8 or less than 2. I would have multiplied everything by 2. You shouldn't pick minus 5 less than 8 or less than 5 because nobody thinks the reseeding fragments that are going straight down the beam pipe are in thermal equilibrium. Um, so, but anyway, it's conventional to use this range of, range of, range of pseudorapidity, and that makes it an underestimate. Um, the other more important reason why it's an underestimate is that um, if after time tau naught, so tau naught is one Fermi, if after a time of one Fermi, the system expands hydrodynamically, which is what we expect, then as it's expanding, it does longitud it, it's expanding longitudinally, it does, it does work. And the fact that it does work in this expansion means that during the hydrodynamic epoch, which I've just erased, but do I have it down here? Yeah. During this hydrodynamic epoch, the energy density, energy density as a function of tau falls faster than 1 over tau. It falls faster because work is being done. If it just fell like 1 over tau, that would just be um, trivial expansion of the size of the box. But because it's a hydrodynamic fluid expanding and doing work, its energy density falls faster than 1 over tau. In fact, in simple, a simple way of doing the calculation, it goes like 1 over tau to the 4 thirds. Um, if the energy density is falling, in reality, is falling faster than 1 over tau, that means that the actual energy density back here has to have been higher than you thought. Because the basis of this was just to think, you just run the clock, you look at the final state, run the clock back, assume that energy was in, assume that, that that energy, that transverse energy was in the box. But if some of the transverse energy has actually been sapped by doing longitudinal work, you have made an underestimate. So people do this more sophisticated than Bjorkane, and but the estimates of the energy density that people get are about, a, you know, of order a factor of two higher than the Bjorkane estimate. So the Bjorkane estimate is good enough for us. Um, and it, it teaches us a very important lesson. It says that if somehow I can convince you tomorrow um, that by a time one Fermi after the collision, the matter that's produced is in thermal equilibrium, then we have quark coulomb plasma. And there are three legs to this case. This is a case that was made in 2005 um, by, by the experimentalists. There are three legs to this case. The first is this estimate of the energy density. The second is the lattice calculation, which says that if you have equilibrated matter with an energy density of 5 GV per cubic Fermi, that's quark coulomb plasma. And then the third and key and most difficult thing to establish is that by a time of one Fermi, it does make sense to talk about a hydrodynamic system. Um, and that's what um, we will do tomorrow. I did not get as far as I wanted to get to. Get to. Um, I think that's life. I will have to. Uh, um, there was two more points that I wanted to make in my basic primer before I start talking about why we think the um, equilibration occurs by one Fermi and why we think the viscosity is small and why we think it's a liquid. Um, I'll begin with those two points tomorrow.